Our first lesson is from Exodus 13, 17 through 22. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine country, though that was shorter. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people by the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. By day, the Lord went ahead of him in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of the cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. Amen. Thank you, Ted, for reading that with us. As you can guess, or have already been told, today's focus is on Christ saying, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> Hear these words from John chapter 8, where he makes that claim for himself. At dawn... Jesus appeared again at the temple courts where the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. And when Jesus spoke to the people, he said this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And the Pharisees challenged him. They say, here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. But Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I come from and I know where I'm going. But you have no idea where I've come from or where I'm going. You only judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true. Because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. Now in your own law, it's written that the testimony of two witnesses of true. I am one who testifies for myself, and my other witness is the Father who sent me. And they ask him, Oh yeah? Who's your father? Well, you don't know my father, Jesus replied. If you did know him, then you would know me as well. And he spoke these words while teaching at the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. And yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. So get the scene. It's morning, dawn, early, probably earlier than I'd like to get up. The sun is just rising in the temper courts. And Jesus makes his way there. The people gather around him because he already has a reputation for saying wonderful, amazing, and outlandish things. They want to know what he'll say next. And Jesus makes this claim. I am the light of the world. Now, as Amanda already uh, illustrated, folks would know, okay, this is a, a big claim. The, if you imagine life not as we know it now, but as it used to be, even just a few centuries ago, when people's lives were much more tied to the rhythms of nature. Light was extremely important. The sun was the source of light and of warmth. Is a source of life. In fact, it's easier for us to imagine this world without humans on it than it is to imagine this world without the sun, without light. In fact, the power of the sun is so evocative that ancient people around the, the globe worshipped the sun as a god. See it in, in uh, South America, in Mexico, in ancient Egypt, in China, all through the Middle East, in, uh, you know, in, G in Egypt, the sun god was known as Ra. In Persia, the sun god was known as Mithrath. In Babylon, Tazmut. And uh, in Greece, can anyone guess? Uh, Solus, the god, or Helios, rather. And in Rome, it was Sol. Everybody worshipped the god because human life, as we know it, is absolutely dependent upon 
the sun, snow, and the light of that, the light that gives light to the whole world. Powerful, right? It's no wonder we, a- in our modern age, we're afforded the self-deception that our life is not so dependent on the sun because we know where groceries come from, stop and shop, right? And we know where light comes from, that switch on the wall. It's a the delusion, really. And yet, we still see evidence of that even today because what day do we gather as today to worship? Sunday. It's not a coincidence. It goes all the way back to ancient Greece and Rome. It's the day of the sun to worship the source. But we are more in touch with sunlight. I am, at least, in my life. My emotional life is like a... a thermometer that goes up and down with sunlight. Anybody else like that? Let's, let me give you a little quiz. This is one of the earliest songs from my childhood that, that touches on the beauty of the sun and positive happy feelings. See if you can follow along with me. It goes like this. Sunny day sweeping the clouds away on my way to where the air is sweet. You know what? Can you tell me how to get to Sesame Street, right? A a fun, happy place where everyone belongs and you get to learn stuff and interact with your neighbors. It's joyful and it starts with a sunny day. It's beautiful. Well, Jesus shows up and he says, I am the light of the world. Come join us, man. Come join us. But Jesus says, he shows up and he says, I'm the light of the world. And he's doing, he's not just tapping into what humans know all around. He's also tapping into scripture. Scripture, the the very first chapter of scripture in the third verse of Genesis. God speaks. And he says, let there be light. And And so things are illuminated, right? And in the last verse, or the last chapter of Scripture, in Revelation 22, it's, it says this about, uh, let me grab it here. It says this, in the new heaven there will be no more light. There will be no, more, there no need for the sun. There will be no night, for God himself will be the light of things. Or if we go back earlier in John's Gospel, earlier than when I read in the first chapter, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was with God. Word, and everything that was made was made through him, and he was the light of life. Right? Light and life. And Jesus says, I am essential for life, just like sun. Just like light. You, you can't imagine it any other way. It's really powerful. It's interesting that the Pharisees respond to Jesus' claim not by overreacting to that outrageous and magnanimous claim, but actually by challenging him on legal technicality. They say, well, yeah, you say you're the light, but what witnesses do you have? The law calls for two witnesses, and you're speaking on your own behalf. You can't be your own witness. They don't challenge him because of what they've seen him to be, They're trying to undo him with a technical, legal challenge, a technicality. And Jesus replies, he says, listen, your law says you need two witnesses. Here are the two, myself and God the Father. But here's the interesting thing about light and witnesses. Light doesn't testify to itself. It doesn't need to, it is its own witness. When the light is on, we know it not because we see the light, but because we, what we see by the light. The light illumines. We don't look at the light. We look at everything else that is illumined. C.S. Lewis says this. He said, I know Christianity is true, similar to the same way I know the sun has risen. Not because I look at the sun, but because I see all things by it. And this is a really true thing about the life of Jesus. It's not just about pointing to Jesus, seeing Jesus, acknowledging Jesus. It's by living 
in the light of Jesus. He says, if you hear my words and do them, then you will know that the Father sent me. You want, an, you want testimony that this is the real deal? Then you've got to take a risk. You've got to bet your life on living the way I'm instructing you to live. Walk in this light that I give you. Walk in this way. Walk in the way of humility, of acknowledging uh, your need for forgiveness, of extending that forgiveness to others, of loving your neighbor like yourself, of entrusting yourself so fully to God's care that just like me, you'd be willing to lay down your life for others. Trust yourself that, and then you will see that my witness is true. Well, if, if Jesus is the light, what does that mean? What does light do? How do we walk in that? I will mention just four things that light does for us. One, it illumines. It illumines the world. That brings understanding and guidance. In the passage that Ted read, talked about the Hebrew children being led by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire at night leading the way. And in the same way, Jesus brings understanding. It's a, a profound thing that you ask, is, is Christianity true? Well, the way we know that isn't by how we argue philosophically. And I, I'm a philosopher and theologian. I like to argue those ways, but that doesn't get us very far. The question to ask is this. Does the way of Jesus illumine this world? Does it make sense of the world we live in? Is it honest about human nature? Does it tell the truth about our hopes and our failures? Does it make sense of the things going on in the world around us? Does it have resources to address the very current challenges of today? Stuff like illness and the science that seeks to respond to it. Issues like injustice and our desire or hunger for justice. Does the Christian story make sense of those things as you walk in them? Amen. Yeah, it's not so much about what we believe. It's about how we walk. Guidance. We, you know, back in the winter when we were uh, memorizing scripture together, remember on that little pack of cards, the very cover one said, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word illumines, brings guidance and understanding. And secondly, sunlight is a disinfectant, right? One of the reasons that the flu season typically drops off in the summer is because there's more light that kills the virus. We were hoping this summer that we would see a, a drop at some of the sunniest places in the country. That's not been true, you know. Have you heard about sunlight laws? Those are local ordinances and state laws and even at the national level that are about transparency. Pulling the actions of elected officials into the light so they can be seen, so that it can, that sunlight can burn off the corruption that's there. You know, the uh, first John chapter one says this about light and its disinfecting influence. It says this is the message that we've, heard from the beginning and we pass on that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all if we walk in the darkness or if we say we have fellowship with God and yet walk in the darkness hiding our deeds hiding ourselves hiding our hearts from one another well then we lie and we don't walk in the truth but if we walk in the light as God is in the light then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Christ frees us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? That is great. A third thing that light does, it's the source of all life and growth. It produces growth. We, you know, I, I was over at the Hildebrands the other day, and, and I, I got to see a little summer squash that Ollie picked before it had a chance to fully grow. But, you know, it pops out of the ground because the sun works with the soil and the seed and the water to pull these things. How many of you are growing tomatoes or zucchinis at your own home? Light produces that. If you're feeling stagnant in your own spiritual life, I would ask you this. How much time are you spending in Jesus' presence? Are you letting the rays of his countenance shine on you to illuminate you, to produce growth? 
I hope so. And finally, last thing is this. Light cheers us. Makes like, like that uh, Sesame Street example. It fills us with hope. At least it does me. Makes us feel good. I, you know, I'll tell you a story about some of the power of this. I think we can relate to it. Charles Colson, in his post uh, Watergate years, in his post conversion years, after he came into the light, uh, he launched this thing called Prison, Prison Fellowship. They wanted to shine the light of Christ in some of the most hopeless situations in prisons. And they met, he and a team of folks met with President Bora, who was the newly elected Democratic president of, of uh, where was he? Yeah, sorry, Ecuador. He and Bora had been involved in revolutionary activity, trying to agitate for democracy before it took hold. And the military, in a military crackdown, he uh, was captured, he's thrown in prison. He was thrown in just a kind of a dark, damp dungeon cell, no windows and no lights. And for three days, he sat silently in the utter darkness. And on the third day, the heavy steel door opened and he heard somebody enter couldn't see what they were doing. They moved over to the corner of the cell and were fussing with something and then silently and without a word left. A few minutes later, a light flickered on. Somebody, probably at peril of their own (laughs) uh, punishment, had gone in and fixed a, a light fixture that had not been functioning. And this is what Bora said. He said, from that moment on, My imprisonment had meaning because at last I could see and I had hope. And he went on to become democratically elected leader of Ecuador. Light comes, even the smallest modicum of it, comes in a a small way. One of the things we know that's true about light is it bounces off of surfaces. And Jesus tells us that we are the light of the world. We are the reflectors of his light to the world around us. We can be that and function in those same ways to help bring hope and cheerfulness, to call forth growth and life in folks, to have a disinfecting influence in the culture around us, right? And also to bring illumination, understanding as we reflect back the light of Christ. This week, uh, midweek, we had some friends who were here from out of town were visiting. So we wanted to get together and do it in a safe way. So we sat in chairs in our backyard around a fire pit in the middle and the fire is burning and we're all separated by like 10 feet with flame in between. But one of the things we did that night, Laura had found a letter of recommendation. It had been written by a dear friend of mine. He since uh, has has left this world uh, prematurely, a brilliant sociologist and former colleague of mine. He had written a letter of recommendation for one of the other people that were gathered in the circle. Laura found it and wanted to read it to her as a, a bit of encouragement. And he, the th- <laughs> he said a lot of really true and beautiful things. But the thing that caught me and has stuck with me, he said this, Becky has a smile that could ruin a pessimist's day. (laughs) Isn't that great? She has a smile that could ruin a pessimist's day. Well, you know, as ones who claim the name of Christ, who say we're followers of Jesus, who are Christians, we are like those little lights reflecting his glory, the light of the world that brings illumination and understanding, growth and life of healing and and, uh, kind of disinfecting influence as well as cheerfulness and hope to the world around us that's beautiful this world needs that our lives continue to need that and we find that by making time deliberately corporately like this or individually to spend time in Jesus' presence i'll just close with this last little comment i'm going to play a song for you at, at the benediction after our final hymn you can listen to it or you, if you need to take off, you can. But it's by um, Ben Harper in The Blind Boys from Alabama. It came up in my car this, this week as I was driving. And the, the title of the song is, There Will Be a Light. There Will Be a Light. 
And as uh, Ben Harper has this beautiful voice, yeah, he starts the first verse. But then throughout the song, these other old voices come in. And they're the worn, tattered voices of these senior African-American men who are all blind. And they're singing as an act of faith, as a declaration of hope, there will be a light. There will be a light. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful statement. These guys who in their earthly days have been deprived the light lets them see. But they see more than that, more than just physical light. They're on to a spiritual truth. And they hold that with hope and with faith that the day is coming when every corner will be illuminated. Or as Revelation says, there will be no more need for the sun for God himself will be the light. Amen. Amen. Isn't that great? Let's close with our final hymn. It's one of my favorite tunes, Beach Spring. The lyrics might be unfamiliar, but they're printed in the bulletin. The very last line is, As rainbow lights the heavens when a storm is past and gone, may our lives reflect the radiance of God's new and glorious dawn. Amen.